Well, good evening, and thanks so much for tuning in for another episode of Mid American Gardener, the uh, Shelter at Home edition. I'm your host, Tanisha Spain, and we are doing the show from home, as you have uh, no doubt noticed in the past few weeks. Um, got some panelists on the line as well to answer your questions. So please send us your uh, questions in the comment section so we can get those answered. We have some that you sent in already to answer to get us started, but if you're just tuning in, Make sure you get us those gardening questions uh, so that Doug and Ella can answer them. So uh, just let's jump right in and have our panelists introduce themselves and tell you a little bit more about their backgrounds and what their interests are. So Doug, we'll start with you. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Doug Williams. I'm a horticulturist and landscape uh, architect by degrees. Uh, I work as an AmeriCorps VISTA in the city of Chicago with uh, as a capacity builder for a couple of organizations. So I'm here to answer your design questions about woody plants and herbaceous plants and things in the landscape. Uh, everything from as small as a flower arrangement to uh, other things beyond that. So I'll leave it at that. All right, wonderful. Well, and Ella. Oh, Echo. <laughs> Ella, go ahead. Oh, I think she's frozen. Hi, there she I'm, is. Go ahead. I'm Ella Maxwell. Um, I'm a horticulturist at Hare Nursery. I'm also a a Tazewell County Master Gardener, and uh, uh, my expertise is perennials and trees and shrubs. Um, I have a large garden, and I enjoy gardening, so I hope we get some good questions. Awesome. Okay, so we'll start with show and tells. Ella, I know you've got something to share that I'm insanely jealous about. Well, not really, uh, Tanisha, but uh, this is my pot of amaryllis and I am going to repot it for spring, but I left it in a dark, uh, in the basement in a dark room and it started to grow and I took it out two days ago. This was pure white. It's still pretty light color, but it's going to green up as it's outside now. But I'm going to miss these nice blooms. I'm not sure it's going to straighten up, but you can see that the bloom does come before the leaves. I've got three bulbs in here and really only one is blooming. So I'm going to repot it, keep it fertilized. And next year I'm going to be on the ball. Me too, with mine that haven't bloomed in three years. So maybe next year it'll be a good year for both of us. I have a show and tell uh, question. As you know, I'm a, a junior gardener among you. So um, this is a succulent that I've got and it was gifted to me a couple weeks ago. I'll try to do like the kids do on YouTube. Um, it was gifted to me a couple weeks ago and it's just not doing real well. It's floppy, it's sad. Um, so what can I do to help this guy get back on the right track and, and survive? And I'm normally, you know, I've got plants everywhere, but succulents, that's my weak spot. And I, it's crazy because they're supposed to be low maintenance. So help me uh, nurse this guy back to health. Doug, what do you think? Well, uh, yeah. What do you think, Doug? Well, let's see. Is it, is it a J plant? Just a regular succulent, huh? It's... You, you repotted it. It looks like it's probably going to have to adjust. You want to be sure you don't want to overwater it or underwater it. That's probably one of the hardest things with plants, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you have a new container. You got to kind of get a feel for what the weight of the pot or the container is. Okay. Um, hopefully your soil is, um, you know, it's a quality soil, and not too clay. Uh, not no, too I made it. I made a good potting mix, it and uh, it's not it's not overly wet, not dry. But uh, it just doesn't look real happy. <laughs> well, you just, you, how long has it been there? Just a few? Like two weeks. Oh, and how it. many leaves did it lose? Um, uh, I would say about four, four or five. Transplant shock? Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Another thing too, to think about where you're locating. I think you got a lot of, a lot of nice plants behind you, making sure that it's not in the, you know, it's still kind of cool out. So if the heater is nearby, it's mm -hmm. going to with heat on it. Um, it's in a want... sunny window on a shelf. So I don't know. I guess I'll just keep watching and not, I'll give it a little bit more time to perk up. I guess it needs a little bit more time to get used to its new home. So yeah. we'll try that. Okay, let's move into our, some of our questions. We do have some Facebook questions, but let's start out with some of the email questions that we have sent in. And Doug, we'll start with you. This is question 912 for DJR Director. 
Um, the attached photos show some malformed leaves on uh, hydrangea bushes. When I pruned these bushes this spring, there were several long branches where the leaves either did not open or were opening with clusters of malformed leaves. Um, she cut them back to the ground, but some of the other branches um, didn't develop. Overall, the bush seems healthy. Is this a problem that she should address? Yes or no, Peggy from Charleston. So we got the pictures there. Um, so she's mostly concerned about the malformed leaves or in some of those leaves that didn't open. Um, so what do you, what situation or condition do you think she's dealing with? Well, it looks like it could be a couple of different things. Uh, some say it may be a, some type of herbicide. It may have been sprayed and, and drifted onto the plant. Uh, it could also be an insect. Uh, they could be uh, deforming the, uh, the young leaf growth. Um, I think you mentioned that when it was cut back, some of the branches came back fine. That may be the case, but also you wanna be sure you clean up the space where right around the plants. If you have um, other things that are in the debris, you wanna be sure you remove those. And if you're gonna compost, compost that on the other side of the house, you know, mm -hmm. far enough away where if there are larvae or other insects, they aren't just reinfecting the plant that you have there. We did have a very wet year. Um, Last year, we probably looked like we may have another one, so that may have caused, uh, made it susceptible to some of these uh, signs that we see right now. How about you guys? Ellen, you got anything you want to add to that? Well, um, if it was indeed herbicide damage, it could have been from some herbicide that was applied uh, maybe off target from around the base of it because if it was a drift problem it probably would have shown up with other plant material in the yard as well so when it's localized on one plant it can sometimes be from a product that you would have used nearby on the soil surface so i'm not sure but i agree that it very possibly could be insect related some type of my oh, Ella, we lost her. That is causing you. that distortion. I think best way to address it. Oh. We lost you in Again. some part at the end, but we got most of the drift. So okay, great. <laughs> All right, so we've got some Facebook questions coming in. First one is from Marsha Taft Harbor. Wants to know if it's too late to plant marigolds for a bloom this year. No, 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 no. no. I have some sitting right by the door, uh, both doors actually for mosquitoes and other things. So uh, not too late on that one. Uh, let's see, Jeff and Monica DeWeese uh, says, I have linden trees that have not bloomed. I think they have scale. How do I treat this? Anybody want to take a crack at this one? Well, uh, I have not seen scale on linden trees. And when they say not bloom, I think they mean that it hasn't leafed out. And uh, they are probably a little slower than some of the maples. Usually maples are, are problematic with like an oyster shell scale. And that would be, um, uh, uh, you could use uh, several different kinds of insecticides. Uh, you could check at the garden center and see what they recommend and time it for the right spray. But uh, um, you'd almost have to take in a sample to be sure. Doug, do you have anything you wanted to add there? No, it sounds about right. Usually on lindens, you have other um, like aphid type things that are causing the dew or sap to, to uh, be dispersed. And that's usually after the leaves and have come out. Uh, it's so early right now, I don't think, uh, I do see a couple of lindens that have leafed out pretty well. So um, yeah, I think an insecticide may be the best treatment. Uh, talk with your local, um, garden center and nursery uh, and see what they have available. Um, but yeah, take a look at it, see what you see underneath the leaves or around it too, to kind of get a better picture. Okay. All right, Tiffany Bell write, writes in, uh, hello, I'm so glad you guys are doing MAG at home. We are too. <laughs> it is so nice to see something regular and all that's going on. My question is about a tropical hibiscus I bought. I believe it has some powdery mildew. What should I do to help it along? And will it spread to my nearby cannas? So powdery mildew, um, how will she know if that's what she's dealing with? It will wipe off. She can wipe the leaf off and wipe the mildew away. That's okay. one thing about mildew. And uh, it's a 
problem in high humidity situations. So once uh, the weather moderates and she can have her hibiscus outside, I doubt it will be a long-term problem. Okay. And then the second part of that question was, you know, could those spores or I, I guess it was spores. That's spore. That's okay. Correct. Could it blow to nearby plants? Doug shaking his head. Yes. You don't think so. Okay. Okay. Doug, you, uh, you were you saying it? yes, or were you just kind of following along? No, I mean, <laughs> it, 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 do on Canis? not really. I mean, it, I mean, the spores will probably may deposit themselves, but it's not anything it would, would find. I don't, I've never seen it take over a canna, but it could, but the likelihood okay. is probably pretty low, but okay. um, yeah. All right. Um, let's see. Another question from Tiffany. She's on a roll. Uh, also, if I have Xenia and Cosmo seeds, can I just blend them together and plant that way or do they have to be separated? Well, they can be blended, but you know, Cosmos, those get really tall. I've had a few I planted around <laughs> and they were like four or five, six feet tall. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So that'll yeah. just tower right yeah. over. Yeah, they didn't bloom. My, my cosmos didn't bloom until much later in the season, maybe because it was wet last year and I didn't really get them in the ground until almost the first week of June, mm -hmm. uh, seed wise. But they, they even reseeded this year. So I have some that I don't have to go and plant from seed. They already started growing. Um, so I've got about six of those. So that'll be plenty, <laughs> at least. <for> <laughs> um, you know, Ella, I'm sorry to cut you off, Doug. Were you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Ella, if she wanted to have both of these in the same bed or in the same arrangement or in the same area, um, what are some tips um, as a nursery expert to, to, to do that since they're so different in their sizes? Is there a way to make that happen? Oh, sure there would be. I, I think the most important thing is, is uh, the taller plants go towards the back and uh, rather than blending them, she could just make two different rows and that would work really well. And uh, seeding them is still plenty of time to be able to have a good floral display. Okay. All right. Dan uh, Phillips writes in, could all the recent rain cause nitrogen depletion? Yes. <laughs> okay. I mean, nitrogen is a soluble nutrient and it could leach potentially. Okay. So um, that's why people use miracle Grow products, you know, as frequently as every two weeks. And uh, the granular products would last longer. And of course there's organics. Okay. His question got cut off. It's, it's two parts. Um, it says his, his yard is yellowing. So he's wondering if the nitrogen depletion is causing his grass to yellow. And I know Doug, that's, you're the turf guy. So, you know, is that, is that potentially what he's seeing? Or do you think there could be other things at play? Um, I, th I think fertilizer is important. I don't, think, I don't think we have grub worms out just yet, but they may be. I did see a regular fly growing, flying around. So some things may be maturing underground. Um, if it's something that's new, if you've always had sort of green grass, um, just look at what practices you had during that time period. And if something is different or anything is environmental, then it probably is that rain alone. Mm -hmm. um, I can't think, I wouldn't want you to just go out there and dump a whole lot of fertilizer on it because I'm not big on that because a lot of that will leach into our water system. So you want to be mindful of that. Um, Give it a little time. Um, this is spring, so some things start off a little ways. I've seen a lot of green grass everywhere. And maybe even if you let it grow relatively long and then cut it, then that lower growth may be still somewhat yellow trying to re become. Oh, yeah, yeah. If it hadn't had as much light or something. Right, but okay. um, yeah, give it a little time. Wait, wait about you know, a week or two and see if it's still the same. If not, then maybe an a nice NP and K fertilizer. Uh, some people do weed and feed so around this time, but you don't want to do that at the time when you want some of that to, to stick to the leaf and not just wash mm -hmm. off immediately. So mm -hmm. keep that in mind. And we've mind. got, I think I looked at the forecast. We've got about a, a nice week stretch where there's spraying in the forecast every day. So maybe not now <laughs> is the best time to do that. Okay, uh, let's see. Clella, sorry if I didn't pronounce that properly. Schultz writes in, can you trim large blue spruce bushes some, or is it best to just start over? We're, we're not sure what kind of severe pruning she might be thinking to have to start over, but um, the evergreens, um, 
grow differently. They only grow on the ends. And so if you do too much pruning, you cut off that potential regrowth. And that might be where she's, you can't cut them back so far because they won't recover. So sometimes starting over might be that the recourse she needs to take. Okay. Anything to add on that one, Doug? Um, if you've got Doug, what several, do you think? Kind of breaking up. If you have several of them, probably try it on one. You know, if you got a little chance to experiment and see, you know, maybe one is a little not totally back, because that obviously will leave it with less of a chance to recover, but you know, maybe cut it significantly back and have a little bit of growth and see how it recuperates. And if it looks like something that shows promise, and you might try it with some of the other ones. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, make sure if you're watching uh, and you have a question for these guys uh, to send them in and we are rocking and rolling right through them. Uh, next one is Mary Beth Massey. She says, I recently purchased a fiddle leaf fig. Any special needs for this? Hey, is that, that's what's, no, that's the bird nest. Never mind. I thought that was what was behind me. Um, any, any special care for the fiddle leaf? I think it's a low light relatively speaking, good indoor house plant. Okay. All right. Um, do you, and I've heard a couple different schools of thought here. Um, do you feed indoor plants? I've heard some people say absolutely not never. And I know some people who do it religiously um, and some people only do it at a certain season. So what's your take on fertilizing or feeding plants that you're going to keep indoors? And eat, feel free to jump in either one of you. <laughs> well, most of the tropicals that are coming out of Florida are very heavily fertilized in their growing applications, and a lot of them have pelletized, like slow-release fertilizers in them. Um, so again, you want to only encourage growth when other things are optimized, like sunlight, mostly sunlight, because you can control the watering indoors. So that's why you don't do it during the winter or I wouldn't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. All right, Ella, we're going to do a question for you. Uh, question 913. This is a tree ID. Uh, this small volunteer tree has heart shaped leaves in summer that look like those of a red bud. However, as you can see from the picture, uh, the blossoms, which came in early May, are not in the pink color of the well-known tree. Is this a variety of red bud tree or is this just a nuisance tree? <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Um, well, Sue, this is a red bud that failed to flower. The flower buds are formed the previous season, uh, usually at the base of those different nodes. And these are just new leaf, um, new little stems that are coming out. And uh, they're not flowers. It's the leaf and she'll have a real red bud tree. And they can receive themselves, I would not think that they were a nuisance. Okay. All right. Uh, Kathy writes in, any tips for growing globe artichokes? Is that the same as Jerusalem chokes, sun chokes? Or is that something totally different? I think aren't globe artichokes real artichokes? See, I don't know. I just thought globe, sun chokes, they look circular. No, no, you know. a globe, it, globe would be, you know, the large, the real artichokes with the mm -hmm. flower where you eat the flower, not the underground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I knew that they weren't real artichokes, but you know what? Let me, while we're on this, you garden people have really did a number on some of these names. Let me tell you, because <laughs> just like when you think something is going to make sense, it doesn't. Like calling sun chokes, sun chokes. They're not chokes. They're not even related, but we just go with it. And for people like me who are learning, it's like learning the English language. There's all these like, but, or not in this case. <laughs> well, really, Tanisha, common names are kind of slang because they can be very regional. Mm -hmm. So true horticulturists, um, and landscape architects would use the botanical name and then there would be no confusion. Oh, I got but you. That's, era. that's hard to pronounce and hard to spell. Ella is a pinky up <laughs> professional. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, let's see. While we're talking about trees, uh, there's another question. It's kind of a long one. DJ 911. Uh, we have two apple trees we planted, one seven years ago, a honey crisp, and one three years ago, a gala. Both have grown considerably, but we have yet to see any blooms. Is this normal for these trees at a young age, or do we have something else going on? Thank you. Um, so, you know, once you get one of these trees in the ground, guys, how long does it take before you'll be able to see uh, blooms or they even bear fruit? What's the timeline? Doug, I thought you were gonna answer this one. You were both waiting for each other. Yes. <laughs> you might know better. I haven't grown any apple trees. Um, and it's been a while since I was in servants class too, but no, I've been to some orchard, but maybe Ella, you, you have some insight on that or? Well, um, most of the apple trees that are sold um, at the home stores or garden centers are probably semi dwarf or, or dwarf. I think there's very few standard apple trees out there anymore. Most have been grafted. And um, usually if they're getting enough sunlight, again, the flowers are formed the year before. So um, in the spring, um, that's when you should see flower buds coming out. And if you don't, sometimes the apples can also alternately bear. So one year there's lots of flowers oh, and then dang. the next year, here there's very few, but pruning or browsing the ends, they should get flowers. Sorry, mm -hmm. I got stuck. That's okay. Again. That's okay. Okay, we're going to Pat, uh, Kathy Peters. Uh, my sister in law shared a bag of some pelletized chicken manure. What would you recommend as the best use of that in the garden? Excuse me. <laughs> pelletized chicken manure. I think anything. Don't you think, Doug? Yeah, sure. It's um, nothing like uh, guano or that's for bats, but this, you know, fertilizer is great and it's organic <laughs> in this case. Um, yeah, integrate it into the soil profile around the plant you want to um, you want to grow. Do you have to, I have chickens, do you have to um, let it sit for a while? Is it too hot to use immediately? Ella, do you know? Do you have to let chicken droppings kind of bake a little? I think she's frozen. Yep, she is. Okay, next question. Uh, let's see. We're going to uh, Joseph Spencer. I have Illinois cut plants spreading aggressively in some prairie gardens. Um, will paint Roundup on the leaves and wants to know if that will work. Painting Roundup on the leaves, if that will work. Getting rid of cup plants. I, I think it would work, but I would rather that they took a shovel and just you know, popped at the, at the base and, you know, the, I think that just digging it out would be better or they could even share it, dig it up to share it. Okay, all right. All right, uh, let's see. Kathy Montgomery is, uh, I'm getting the globe artichoke at the veggie sale at ISU. It's the regular artichoke. So thank you, Kathy, for that. <laughs> um, Geraldine says, our growing season is not long enough to make an artichoke. The large silver leaves are the reason. Oh, that's more of a comment. Do either one of you grow artichokes? No, I, I haven't because of the long season, but at work we are growing the ornamental one with the more silver foliage just for, you know, a, a, a textural element. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Geraldine chimes in and says chicken manure is too hot to use fresh. It must be composted. I remember somebody saying that, but I wasn't quite sure. And now we know. All right. Back to our write-in questions. Uh, Doug, let's see. This is a long one for you. 914 about the willow tree. Um, and I won't read the whole thing. I'll kind of paraphrase, but this person's writing in about a tricolor dappled willow tree, bought it last year and it was delivered in May. Beautiful all summer. Um, now it's not showing any signs of budding or leafing out. The trunk is grafted or the trunk that it's grafted onto keeps sending out sprouts at the base and I cut them off. Am I too impatient? Um, just looking for some direction that said they love the show. And the photo that they attached is from May 17th. So um, not seeing any, any movement, no buds, no leafing. It was beautiful and healthy a year ago. What do you think? Well, um, 
one thing is you can scratch the, some of the upper stems on the top portion of the graft um, because this is a, one of those plants you'd love to have growing. It's got the variegated color. It's got uh, sort of a pinkish, whitish, uh, green uh, display. Um, so see if that if there's green under those uh, underneath the surface of some of those stems. Don't go scratching it everywhere, but just scratch a few of those um, to, to find out if there's some sap and some life that's there. Mm -hmm. It could be delayed, it could be stressed, um, and that could be a part of it. You're doing the right thing by cutting those uh, sports or suckers from the base because that is probably not the variegated portion that you are you have grafted to the top. It has a, probably a stronger root base. And so that is probably doing quite well. However, the stress at the top is what you want to pay attention to and see if, if something happens this year. If nothing happens this year, that is probably an indication that it did not survive. And if you don't see any uh, green uh, underneath those stems. Any other thoughts, guys? No, oh, anything there? Okay. All right, Ella, we've got another one for you. This is about dogwood. This is tree night, I guess. <laughs> okay. uh, 916. Uh, I am concerned about my 18 year old Cherokee chief dogwood. The trunk has colored growth on it and I'm not sure if this is normal or a fungus. Uh, this season, the tree did not have many blooms um, as it usually does. And she's not sure if this is due from the weather or if it's sick, health related. Uh, thanks for your help, Cindy from Decatur. Um, so there's that photo. So she's seeing some discoloration and fewer blooms. Ella, what do you think? Well, in the close-up picture of the trunk of the tree, we can see lichens. And these are, um, they don't interfere with the plant health. They just um, are growing on the trunk of the tree. And if she's really concerned, she could take like a vegetable brush and she could scrub them off uh, because they're not attached or embedded in the tree. It's just because the bark is growing so slowly. But it does look like she has a, a wound or two on there, but they seem to be sealing over well. So I would say it's the lack of blooms is more weather related and that if she increases the fertility during this summer growing season, she can increase her blooms for net to go through and, and bloom well. Okay. We had another comment that said, um, Geraldine, my dog would have had few blooms also. Um, so maybe it's, you know, weather, weather related too in there. Let's see, Connie Stevenson Crawl writes in, is there any um, systematic, systemic I can use on my crab apple tree to keep the Japanese beetles away? Um, there are systemic chemicals that she could use. Uh, the problem is you don't want to use them too early in the spring when the uh, flowers are out because I'm not sure exactly um, if it would translocate for pollinator um, problems, but once they're done blooming or at petal fall, if she wanted to use a, a midacloprid product that does take about three to four weeks to take up. And usually we don't see beetles until the middle of June. So I think she could do it. Okay, wonderful. Let's see if we've got any, a um, couple other people chiming in about their dogwoods. So yeah, we had a, a tree themed night uh, this evening. Um, as far as this rain goes, I have apple trees and I have a pear tree in my yard. Um, I miss petal fall because it's been raining nonstop. So for people like me who miss that window to treat, um, is all hope lost? Can I still try? Um, even though I, I didn't get that, that window in there for the first treatment on my fruit trees? Oh, this is for sprays to, to increase the quality of your fruit because you're going to follow a spray schedule. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you miss one, you just get right back up and okay. you know, just follow the schedule. Don't try to put in extra ones. Mm -hmm. If you missed it, you missed it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I just didn't know if missing that first one, you know, at Petal Fall. Where you would have left off. Okay. Okay. We still usually get a lot of misshapen fruit, but um, every year that I follow the schedule, it does get better and better. So I think, 
I think we're on the right track. So, all right, well, it is eight o'clock. Thank you guys so much for, it went quick. Uh, thank you so much for dedicating your time to us and your talents and knowledge. And um, sorry that my kid showed up in his pajamas, but we are working from home and that's just what it is. <laughs> So thank you guys so much. Thank you for everyone who joined us. Uh, we're going to keep this up until we can get back in the studio. So please, anytime, reach out and send us your questions. Gmail, uh, yourgarden at gmail.com. Of course, you all know how to find us on Facebook and you can send your questions in there. Um, but we're going to keep plugging along and hopefully uh, we'll, we'll be back in the studio soon. But things are going really nicely right now. I like this stay at home edition. And maybe one day Ella will let us uh, in on her record collection. She said that's only the tip of the iceberg, so I can't imagine how many others are in the house. But anywho, thanks a lot, and uh, we'll see you next time. Good night. Thank you.